introduce our first Hot Topics speaker on the role of paleoscience and IPCC. It's Jonathan Overpeck from the University of Arizona. I think most of you know Peck, but if you don't, I, I copied his brief biographical statement and I won't read it to you, but just a few things about Peck. He's director of the Institute for the Study of Planet Earth at the University of Arizona, where he's also a professor of geosciences and a professor of atmospheric sciences. Uh, very pertinent to this group is that he was founding co-chair of both the international and US Clivar Pages working groups. And Peck was also, uh, in the last IPC, the coordinating lead author for the paleoclimate chapter. And next week, he's going to the scoping meeting in Venice uh, to start scoping out the next IPCC, the fifth assessment of Porter AR5. So without any more introduction, Peck. Thanks, Betty. So I had uh, spent most of my summer, my, all my, my vacation time with my family in a beautiful uh, northern Michigan, uh, flat on my back with a cold and a flu, and I still have a cough. So halfway through this talk, I'll probably start coughing and you, you'll think I'm dying, and I won't be. Um, this is a real pleasure to talk. Uh, th Thomas Stocker was uh, going to give this presentation originally, and I, that must have been before the scoping meeting in Venice was scheduled because um, as a co-chair of the working group one uh, and one of the six co-chairs of the uh, fifth assessment, uh, he's going to be uh, not sleeping and just working around the clock and being able to pull off uh, traveling around the world in the middle of all that is, is very taxing. So, so he sends his regards and uh, I'm going to try and give a presentation today that um, reflects my views on the whole situation uh, since uh, I am not um, representing the IPCC in any way. Um, and that's what it would have said down there in the bottom, even though I have a Mac, which is interesting. Um, what I'm going to do today is I want to I, I talk about science, and, and, but the most important thing to me is that uh, everyone who's here understands the process uh, that uh, the IPCC represents and can be involved in the process to ensure that the policymakers and the decision makers who are around the world who are increasingly using the output of the IPCC for not just mitigation negotiations and discussions, but also climate change adaptation, uh, can tap into the incredible wealth of uh, relevant science that comes out of the paleo community. So I'm going to talk about what the IPCC is and what it's not. As you'll see as I get into this, um, part of it is, is kind of focused more on our, my American colleagues, simply because even with our new administration, there's an incredible uh, effort going on to uh, politicize climate change and along with that uh, much of our science in the IPCC and I think everyone in the room and needs to go out and tell your colleagues uh, make sure they really understand what the IPCC is and what it's not because you read the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal and uh, listen to Rush Limbaugh and, and uh, you know these guys are just getting it flat out wrong. Um, then the more important part of this presentation is uh, one slide, you know, where we were in the AR4 and then a bunch of slides on where we're going, I think. And as you'll see, no way could anyone, even Thomas, give you a crystal ball glimpse of what it's going to look like in 2014 when it's published. What I can give you is a, is a framework that I think uh, will guide us us all in trying to uh, put the best paleo science forward and a lot of the science that has not yet been published as you'll see. And I also want to try and, and I'm not doing a good job, I can tell already, uh, get done in time so we can have a discussion if there are any questions and if anyone says, well, you know, what about this study? Because unfortunately I have to leave tomorrow to go to a meeting in Colorado and then to Europe and so I won't get to see all the great science at this meeting which would have been ideal. Uh, before going to the scoping meeting. All right, well, thank you for fixing the slides. All right, so what the IPCC is not, all right? You hear this all the time in America. You know, my international colleagues will be laughing by the time I go through this list. 
um, but it's some kind of bureaucratic UN organization that's just, you know, wants to make the world do something. Um, it's a politicized body of some kind. And the, science are, the scientists are all in a big conspiracy to fool the American public. Um, I, I'm not kidding you. You know, this is what you read in our media. Um, and, it's, and even some of our colleagues who are a little more moderate still like to, to, to go out there and off the top, top of their head say, well, it's a pretty closed group of scientists and, you know, it's not representing everybody. Bullshit. Okay? Um, more to the point, uh, more generally though, everyone should realize the IPC is absolutely not a research effort. There's, the IPCC does new, no research, has no money. It's an assessment effort. It's not a review of all climate science. A lot, you know, and this is, I, even I, you know, going into being uh, one of the, the convening lead authors, coordinating lead authors, didn't realize. It's all about relevance. Okay, so what it is, Okay, and I'm not going to read this because this sort of comes out of IPC speak. But it's an intergovernmental body. What does that mean? Well, it means that all the nations of the world who care, and there are about 113, I think, that were in the last round, have delegations that meet regularly, like once or twice a year, uh, to agree with the scientists on the ground rules. They don't dictate the science at all, though. Um, then they also agree and nominate and agree on uh, the best available uh, expertise. These are the, the authors, and as you'll see, it's not a closed list at all. Um, it's also, uh, and this is the point I was mentioning before, it's all about policy relevance. And I, I think as our world moves into a much more, we're dealing with climate change rather than just talking about it. everyone in this room and all your students for the next couple generations, we have to be thinking more about relevance. We have to be thinking more about getting the, the knowledge in the hands of the decision makers so they can actually deal with the problems that we have created. All right? And the other thing that's very important to realize, and I sort of went overboard here, but these are the, these are the words that I've seen used by the IPCC. It's, it's, to be co it's comprehensive. We have to read and assess everything we can get our hands on. It's open and transparent. Everything that we do is on the web in advance. Um, comments that come in from reviewers. It's peer-reviewed. There are like four peer review cycles. This is nothing like writing a paper for science or nature. This is a whole new level. It's all on the web, everything, the comments and the responses to those comments. There's, there's nothing hidden. Anyone can comment. You could be, you know, a homeless guy in L.A., and you, if you know how to use a computer, you could make comments on the IPCC and have them taken seriously. All right. Everyone probably knows this. There are three working groups. Now, I'm going to point, there's a reason I'm pointing this out, though. There's the working group one, the physical basis. This is what paleo <clears throat> was so strong in, I think, the last time around. And certainly in the earlier assessments, even though there wasn't a paleo chapter, there was, there was paleo had big impact. And you could just see that impact grow and grow and grow. I mean, we have come of age as a field. There's working group two, which is impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Hmm. So those are the guys that actually have to take the physical basis and translate it into terms that can be used by the decision makers, the policy makers. Then there's mitigation and everything related to that, meaning, you know, what do we do about this problem if we don't like all of the impacts or the cost of adaptation or the vulnerability that we've highlighted, okay? And what's going on, uh, I'd say a weakness of the IC IPCC process because of all of that open and transparent it's an amazing, and peer review, it's an amazing amount of work. So what ha doesn't happen as much as it should is having interaction between these working groups. And I think each cycle, what we're seeing is more and more of that. The governments in the intergovernmental body say, please work together more. And the scientists are like, we'll try. And, you know, increasingly, I think their mechanisms have been discovered to do that. And so there's, there's going to be more and more of that. And again, I think a lot of us in the room think of us as we're physical scientists, meaning, or natural scientists. We work with the biology, the climate system. Um, but the blurring of the edge between these two especially, and, and you're going to see interesting ways this is going to get blurred too. Um, we're all going to be having to get trained, at least our students, more in how to talk between these kinds of communities, interdisciplinary communities. Because we have to deal with this problem. Now here's the interesting thing. These physical science 
uh, the role of the paleo, you know, what was the title of this talk, role of paleo science in the fifth assessment? Well, there's going to be a lot of it in the, in the working group one report. Will there be a chapter or not? We still don't know. Um, that is what we scope out and get, uh, you know, agree with the, uh, recommend to and they agree, uh, the governments. The thing that's interesting, the mystery I want you to think about as I go through this presentation, and probably a bunch of you already can figure it out. Working group two, loud and clear in the scoping document, are saying, we need paleo two. That is something new. All right, why are they calling for paleo? I'm going to answer that question in this talk, but I'm not going to do it now because I want you to listen. Um, and then there's working group three. They're still uh, not calling out for paleo, but we'll get them sooner or later. All right. Now this is in the scoping document that was prepared for Venice. I assume written by Thomas, or at least made sure it was all right. And uh, Chin Da He from China is the other co-chair, by the way. Um, I thought I had a list of these guys. I guess I blew through that. Um, and this sort of gives you a sense of, again, what we're all trying to do, but it has a very interesting clue in it. Um, our goal, our guiding principle is to assess the sci with scientific rigor the physical science basis of climate change as it is firmly rooted in the public lit published literature. Working Group 1 is pretty dogmatic about uh, peer-reviewed literature. Working Group 2, they have to use a lot of reports and things because it's, you know, it's, we're talking vulnerability in the adaptation, impacts, a lot of that's in government reports. But working group one, it's peer-reviewed literature. But the thing that I didn't really realize going into the last cycle was firmly rooted is a very important concept. You know, there's this cutting edge of science, many of the people in the room doing this, right? And it, often you publish something new that opens a lot of eyes, gets a lot of citations, forces you to travel more than you really should. And Gradually, though, the scientific process decides, you know, is this good science? Is it real? Now, of course, it's good science probably, but is it real? Is it firmly rooted? In other words, is it something you could, you could base million, billion dollar decisions on? <laughs> That's what we're all about, is we don't want to, and, and, and you'll see, uh, you know, a good example I'll talk a little more about is the sea level problem we had in working group one last time. You don't want to go with the science that just really cool, really hot, but you just don't know if it's going to stand the test of time. Um, and that's something we have to weigh in this kind of report, because it's policymakers. Like, whatever we say, they're going to believe, or they're going to maybe politicize if they don't believe it. Okay. Um, and then we have to also do a second thing, is we have to bring this, um, the robust, firmly rooted stuff forward in a way that policymakers can understand. Of course, how many policymakers could read our chapter six? Hopefully everyone in the room has read it, or parts of it. That really wasn't written for policymakers, but it was written in a way when coupled with the, the summary for, uh, the technical summary and the a summary for policymakers that um, high level policymakers could read that summary for policymakers. They could say, I need to know more about this, and they could pick one of their staffers who understands science a little more, read that technical summary, they could probably pick one of their staffers who can actually get into chapter six and figure out what's going on, you know, even without a PhD in paleo. So you got to be, you, that's a whole other reason why so much effort goes into this, to write it in a way that, that can actually be useful. <coughs> we all have to do that. Oh, here's this list. So here you can see who, no one's been chosen to be the authors of yet for AR5. These guys have. These are the co-chairs, and I want to sort of give you the hierarchy of authors here so you can understand the role everyone in this room can play. Um, the co-chairs, basically, uh, this was Sue Solomon and, and Chinda Hay last time around. Um, these guys don't sleep. You know, Susan, I don't think, even goes to the, went to the bathroom when we had these plenary sessions with the governments. Um, I mean, it is a gnarly job, and um, they run the show. But running the show is just, I mean, whenever you see Susan or whenever you see Thomas, buy them a beer, <laughs> say thank you. It's an amazing job they do, okay? They have to know everything and they have to track everything and they got six years of hell, basically. But it's a very rewarding thing when it's over, especially for Susan. I'm sure she got that, no, you know, picked up the Nobel Prize or part of it, okay, S on behalf of all the other authors. Um, Chris Field um, is uh, someone who understands paleo. He's going to be one of the co-chairs along with these others. 
uh, that I don't know as well of the working group two. Working group three has three coaches. Okay, now they're, who really does all the work? Um, of course, these guys do all the work. They have to track everything, but who's gonna write each of the chapters? Well, it's led by coordinating lead authors, usually around two, but can be more per chapter, can be less. Um, and then a, a larger number of lead authors. These are all nominated by governments, and then there's give and take between the co-chairs and um, the bureaus, there's, there's a bureaucracy here that has to balance out expertise and regional representation, gender balance, you know, everything to make sure that there's not some kind of bias creeping into the process. And then there's this whole other category of contributing authors. They are not nominated. And basically anyone can be called upon to be a contributing author. And for example, here are all the authors for the Paleo Chapter 6. Eistein Janssen and I were the coordinating lead authors, um, but we had this host of very strong, I think uniformly strong compared to all the other chapters. I mean, everyone on this list contributed uh, lead authors, some of whom are in the room, and who I always thank, and whenever I can buy beers for, because these guys did an amazing job. But we also had this huge host of uh, contributing authors who in some way contributed key analyses, prose, understanding, data manipulations, whatever, um, a whole host of things. Um, these guys are also heroes, and I know a pile of them are in the room here too. Um, and then you have your reviewing editors. There's a job you don't want. Um, that's just pure badness. But it's a very important job because you have to make sure four review cycles that the auth lead authors and the coordinating lead authors take all of the comments seriously. And we're talking each peer review cycle, our chapter had between 1,000 and 2,000 comments. We had four of these cycles. And um, some of them, of course, you know, were from skeptics who said things like, um, you know, ice cores obviously don't work. And that's all they said, and that's pretty easy to deal with that. But a lot of the comments are very substantial. Some came from our colleagues, some came from skeptics, some came from industry, some came from NGOs, anybody, the public. And we had to take each and every one of those seriously, and these lucky gentlemen had to make sure we did it. Not a fun job. Because <coughs> they, they're sort of like the referees. All right. But if you're asked to do any of this, do it. It's a, it's a very interesting experience. Okay, what's the uh, AR5? We're moving into the uh, future, the, the assessment re fifth assessment report. That's the jargon here. Um, next week, there have already been meetings. I think the very first was in Hawaii. Uh, some of you might have been at that meeting. Um, there have been a couple others. Um, but the first real meeting for the AR5 that, that is going to make big decisions about the report is the scoping meeting. And last time there were two scoping meetings. I think, I don't know if there are two this time. Uh, but there's this one in Venice coming up, and all three working groups will be there, about 30 people from each working group. Most of the people who go are ones who've had experience uh, and understand all the sort of intricacies of this, but there'll be some new folks too. Uh, and the goal is to determine the output of the AR-5. That will be, that'll be communicated to the governments. The governments will um, check it out, make suggestions. There'll be some give and take, but more or less, this is, where, this is the group that will decide scientists, in the IPCC, the scientists always decide anything really important. Um, and then there's going to be, um, the goal is by 2014, the government's already said, that's when the report will be done. So then there's a four years, uh, five years uh, to get this job done. That's a lot of time, it sounds like. But believe me, if you're a lead author or, or coordinating lead author, it's, you'll, it seems like it will, time will fly. Kind of like when you're finishing your thesis and it's the worst part of finishing your thesis, and you're working harder than you ever worked in your life. Well, that's like that for about four years, and uh, at least for the CLAs, um, and at times for the LAs, right? You drop everything, you know? Europeans don't even go on vacation, um, <laughs> all right? That's not true. Where's fortunate? No. I mean, you know, you still get to go on vacation, but you know what, these cycles hit at bad times. You know, they, they hit like over the, the uh, Christmas holidays, it stinks, all right? But that's a lot of time, and why is that so important? 
I'm emphasizing this because all of us in this room and all of our colleagues, this is the time to really be uh, kicking, you know, getting your, uh, your lab in gear, uh, doing your thesis research, you know, getting the, getting the key impact papers done because the idea of the fifth assessment is to assess what's come out since the last report, which basically wrapped up in 07, right? But it sort of drew the line in science in 2006, and the science had to be firmly rooted. So really we're talking about the science between 2006 and 2013, the stuff that's in press and peer-reviewed journals, that's what's gonna be really guiding this report. And if you're gonna be the one who says, I've got the perfect proof that the Greenland ice sheet or the West Antarctic ice sheet can collapse in um, 200 years. Well, you want to publish that a few years before 2014 because it has to be firmly rooted before we can really put weight behind it because the decision makers are going to use this stuff. All right? All right, how? The big thing here you're going to realize is that this is an open process. You've got to pay attention to the IPC's website you got to see who the lead authors are, and if you have something you think is really important, you got to send it, even when it's like in the impress stage, um, to those lead, you know, to a lead author that you feel you can trust to communicate with. I mean, the lead authors aren't going to misuse stuff, because but we got to know about the science as soon as it's possible to know about it if we want to get into this process. And everybody should know that they have the responsibility and to contribute to this. Okay. All right, we're gonna try and get more into the science in a sec. <coughs> Where from? Well, AR4, I think really the big thing about AR4, the reason it uh, collected the Nobel Peace Prize was because um, we really nailed the, the reality of climate change, the reality of human causation, and many of the really most important impacts. But unfortunately, the devil's in the detail. We wrote this report, the government's got us to write this report, more to guide the discussion on mitigation. Hey, do we do anything about climate change? How much do we do about climate change? How fast? Um, but it turns out, of course, that climate change is just moving along, probably faster than we anticipated, and that's causing a lot of parts of the country, for example, Western North America, to really starting to take adaptation seriously, dealing with climate change, dealing with less water, for example, dealing with less snow. Um, and so AR4 results are being used for adaptation even though they weren't designed for that. So what we're going to see, and this is me talking, not the IPCC, but I've read a lot of the government um, input <coughs> that we have to respond to, be responsive to, is we have to really be focused more and more on actionable decision support for mitigation and adaptation. Think about that as you do your science. That's what will really make your science have impact in the coming years, all right? So what I'm going to do now is talk a little more about what kind of science will probably be we've got to showcase in this. And by definition, in the amount of time I have here, even if I devoted the whole talk to this, um, I can't cover everything that should be in there. There's fabulous stuff I'm seeing in, in the abstracts here and even in the few talks I've seen and the posters that can be in this, in this report, but I'm just gonna give you a feel for the kind of stuff that I think is gonna to have to be prominent, all right? And I'm gonna work from deep time, pre-quaternary to the present. I'm not gonna talk much about pre-quaternary, actually, um, but it's still important. Um, working time with increasing emphasis to the present, and it's quick. I'm gonna be provocative, and I want you to think, my own view of this, which is not shared by all my colleagues, is that relevance in terms of temporal looking into the future, is the next million years. Why is that? Well, it's because some of the decisions and infrastructure that we're putting into place, think nuclear, high-level nuclear waste disposal, it, you know, has a million-year uh, time scale. And if we make mistakes, don't take into account how climate's gonna evolve over that period of time, it could be very costly for future generations. Nonetheless, the big focus is on the next 100 years, next 200 years. That's the main focus forming what's going to happen over that time period. All right, pre-quaternary. I don't know how many people do pre-quaternary in, in the room, and what we tried to do in the AR4 is, is play up pre-quaternary as much as we could. There's a lot of pushback 
and the reason for that is, unlike the Holocene in the last 2,000 years, or even you know the last 50,000 years, very hard to date these records in a way that you can actually look at time-space variations between, you know, in the data, let alone with the climate forcing. You know, we've got these wonderful records of climate forcing from ice cores in the late Quaternary. When you go back to the Eocene, Paleocene, Cretaceous, even Pliocene, you know, it becomes much more uncertain what the forcing and what the response was. So what you can say is harder to uh, convince our colleagues outside of Paleo. All right. Nonetheless, you know, and also the other thing is, if you want to write about the pre-quaternary, if the geography was different, you have to convince everybody that that didn't matter in terms of the implications for the future. That's harder than you think, as, I, as we found out. Nonetheless, the uh, geologic record has many useful clues regarding surprise behavior and, cli and, syst and climate system sensitivity uh, and thresholds that could be crossed. Uh, beyond which really bad stuff happens. And we don't, we, there is the UN framework con, on convention, uh, climate change convention, whatever it's called. You know, one of the things that the governments really want to avoid is dangerous interference with the climate system. And, um, you know, there are quite a few things we know in the paleo world that have happened in the pre quaternary or even the quaternary that would be pretty, viewed as pretty dangerous if they were to occur in the next 50 to 100 years. Thinking ice sheets collapsing and things like that. Well, the Paleocene Thermal Maximum, as you know, we got some good press in the AR4. Um, what, there's still so much left to be known. I mean, the thing that re surprises me here is we still don't really know the dynamics of this, what caused it. You know, we need to, we have, and there are many, and now we're discovering many more of these kinds of events. We need to nail what caused them. What are the dynamics? What are the implications for the future? There could be some really important implications buried in that. Um, and so I don't want people listening to this talk think that I'm giving pre quaternary short shift because it's, it's quite important. Nonetheless, I want to talk more about the quaternary, <coughs> in part because Pages is more about the quaternary. Um, and um, the next big thing is um, it seems like you know, read the news, you read what the public discussions of climate change, it's like, well, the IPCC has kind of narrowed down what's going to happen. We have a good idea within certain bounds how much a doubling of CO2 would warm the earth and what else would happen. Turns out we probably don't have as good an understanding as we, as we should, and that's why one reason I think Working Group 2 is saying, paleo guys, you know, speak up more. Um, it's not good enough for making a lot of decisions, or the decisions that get made are made are more costly because the uncertainties are so large in what the sensitivity of the climate system is to the radio forcing. And it's also becoming uh, troubling to some scientists that maybe the Earth is changing faster than we thought possible. Think of the Arctic melting. Think of the Western United States drying. Um, these things are projected by the models uh, to occur in this century but it's happening much faster than the model suggests it should be. Is that just variability, natural variability superimposed on anthropogenic? Is that because the climate system is generally more sensitive, some aspects, to radio forcing than we thought? Another way of looking at this, and, I, and this rarely gets brought up, is this is a key IPCC kind of result. You know, it's the equilibrium sensitivity to a doubling of CO2, and what we're looking at is, you know, PDA probability distribution functions are, uh, for a whole bunch of uh, studies, and from these, the IPCC AR4 concluded that the global mean, uh, global mean equilibrium warming for a doubling of CO2 is likely to lie in the range of two to four and a half degrees. So the big thing you should be looking at is likely, all right? That means uh, there's best estimate all right, and then there's statistics behind that, but best estimate. We also said in the report, <coughs> but the upper 95 limit remains difficult to constrain from observations. So in other words, these tails are not well constrained. It could turn out all of a sudden that the sensitivity is a good deal more than we thought. And we can't really solve that problem probably using instrumental data and models alone. 
And it turns out that the policymakers, you know, are worried about the whole picture, but they're especially worried about low probability but high consequence events. They really want us to make sure we get a handle on, the, on these tails, not just in temperature, but in extremes, hydrologic variables, storms, abrupt change. They really want to know if we could get walloped by something we weren't even paying attention to. Because now's the time. We have time to keep those things from happening maybe, or at least put into place the adaptation strategies to reduce our vulnerability. And for the most part, one of the things that's I think also come out of climate science is that most of the impacts that we're worried about scale to sensitivity. In other words, as that sensitivity number goes up, the chance of other big impacts in hydrologic or storms and extremes, the probability of those being more nasty goes up. Okay, so. We're sitting in a good position. And as, I deter as, as we figured out in, in the last assessment, you know, we have to do our job a little better if we want to convince our colleagues. But nonetheless, the paleo world has all of these realizations of forcing and response. In other words, all of these past periods of time when climate forcing was different, and we've got a nice record of what the forcing, how the forcing evolved and how the climate system evolved spatially multi-proxy, multi-component, climate system component. For example, the Pliocene, not as good, well-known forcing, say, as the LGM, but nonetheless very important. Um, the LGM, past interglacials, Holocene, last 2,000 years, all of these can be used to help constrain how well do the models being used to estimate future change, how well do they actually get real climate dynamics correct? real response of the climate system to altered forcing correct. You know, and Betty Otto Bliesner made this figure for us in the Air 4, and we had lunch together today, and I was very heartened to get an update on where we stand with uh, paleo data model intercomparison. I won't get this right, but entirely, but there's, we're getting to the point in our field where the, all the modeling groups are going to be taking their state-of-the-art models that are being used to project into the future, and they're not only going to be looking at projections, we're going to be looking at predictions for the next 30 years, that's a big, big new thing for the IPCC, but we're also going to be looking at most of the modeling groups who have sufficient computer resources at paleo model uh, simulations that can be intercompared using the same darn, same darn models that are being used to project in the future. So we'll be able to use our data, paleo data, to start really saying what can these models do and what can't they do, and that's going to be a huge advance. And there's going to be a whole meeting on, well, can we rank the models? And I don't know if Paleo is going to play in that, and I'm getting a feeling there will be, we're not at that point yet. But right now, you know, it's been multi-model ensemble, every model is as good as every other model. Remember the mystery of working group two. That's not good enough, all right? The LGM is going to be very important and continue to be very important. The Holocene is going to be really important, all right? And one of the things I think that is, you know, everyone's read this uh, wonderful review synthesis that came out uh, last year. There are so, more, so many more records for the Holocene now than really we had our hands uh, on just a few years ago. We really should be able to do a lot better at assessing um, the, the full range of variability during the warm interglacial we're in, or leaving, and under, use that to understand how well our models are able to capture that variability and use that to inform where do we trust the models going into the future and where don't we trust them. Not only do we have much better information in the Holocene timescales of uh, actual response of the system from around the globe, and you know, this is, we all know this is just a subset of what's available now, and it grows by leaps and bounds every year, we also now have these wonderful new records of climate forcing, you know, and they're not as clear as a satellite measurement of solar to, you know, when we're using these cosmogenic isotopes, but nonetheless, the fact that the beryllium 10 and the C14 agree gives us confidence that we can use these to tease out. And, you know, in the latest science, um, I've been told, you know, new, more and more papers coming out on the solar issue. You know, the solar variability does affect climate, but it affects it in a small way. Well, that's a very important thing to nail and nail and nail. 
and to make sure we got it right. Ditto with volcanic forcing and trace gas force and aerosol forcing and dust forcing. You know, we can do all that now. Um, a lot of people sort of say, well, you know, God, we've been studying cold climate abrupt change for a long time. Maybe it's, uh, is it really relevant? And um, yeah, it's very relevant. Um, but we have to, as you do your research, think about how is it relevant to decision making? Well, big things. We still don't know the sensitivity of the MOC, the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation. Can we nail that down better? Is it really immune to collapse in the 21st century and 22nd century? Is there anything going to happen there that might just catch us off guard? Can we understand the dynamics? Can we really get into less describing millennial scale variability and more into understanding the dynamics behind that in a way that crosses time scales, crosses cold climate to warm climate? This is an important stuff. And I, seen some really fantastic stuff about to come out in journals on this topic. And the, and the punchline is actually we're doing pretty good with these models in some cases. A major policymaker request, sea level. This is where a couple of us at least were pretty frustrated by the end. I mean, we did the best we could, but we could not reach consensus on how much could sea level change by the end of this century in the Air Force. Couldn't be done. It will be done <laughs> in the Air Five. And I think that ultimately it's going to be the glaciologists are going to help us figure this out. You know, it's going to be really figuring out how fast can these ice sheet dynamics turn ice sheets into sea level. Um, but I think paleo is going to continue to play a role here. And we just got to be really careful and really tight because a lot of the data, the papers are wonderful that are coming out. But do they really tell us about the rates at which ice sheets can melt? Um, do they really tell us about how, where are the thresholds beyond which an ice sheet will melt? All right, how fast can the, way, the West Antarctic ice sheet and parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet go, the, the, the Greenland ice sheet? We'll be part of that debate. There'll be a whole special meeting on this next year. And I think, you know, some of the stuff that's coming out from uh, Andrew and the modeling that's going with that, I know Dave's here, it's fabulous to see the modeling of the ice sheet, simple models, and we know we're not getting in the, into the, the hardcore dynamics that eventually we need to figure out, but the fact is, you know, these ice sheets were, were waxing and waning, both in the data and the models, in a way that now is starting to come into focus, and we have a couple more years here to see if we can tighten our understanding of that, and by looking at the, the behavior of the ice sheets over multiple interglacial, interglacials, maybe get a sense of where that threshold is beyond which big sea level might happen and be inevitable and irreversible. Because probably everyone in the room would agree these ice sheets are likely to fall apart faster than they can regrow. Okay. Now there's the whole debate of the hockey stick. I think one of the things that our chapter did really well, thanks to the community's effort, and thanks to Keith Briffa, um, Tim Osborne, these guys were heroes, is I think we really put to rest that whole like hockey stick debate. But, you know, there's still much to be done on the last 2,000 years. This is just Mike et al.'s latest um, reconstruction uh, or a compilation of reconstructions. Um, it's no longer the focus isn't like was the medieval warm period warmer or not than the 20th century. That's kind of like old science. What we're really focused on now is get looking at, a, at the globe in a more uh, regionally specific manner. Getting into the hydrology, this is what the stakeholders really want, and determining, you know, what is the sensitivity of the, say, for example, hydro hydrologic system to variations in radio forcing? What are the dynamics behind that? How are climate modes of climate variability affected? And are those dynamics captured by the models we're putting so much trust in to guide mitigation and adaptation? The good news is I think this chap, this figure doesn't get as nearly as much credit as it should. Um, the guys in Bern and in Pick did a wonderful job at the last minute taking their uh, models of intermediate complexity and the latest climate forcings, you know, you can see some of them here, um, and trying to simulate the last thousand years. And the thick line, I don't want to go into the details, but the th and read the chapter if you, if you want to find out more. This, this figure is so great, I think. Um, 
The thick lines are all the forcings, including human and natural. The thin lines are just natural, and you can see if, you know, we weren't the first to do this, but if you don't have the, the anthropogenic forcings in there, the Earth would be getting cooler now. But the thing is, look at that. The gray behind that is the actual, uh, our, our way of depicting the, the observations and the uncertainty. So the darker the, the shading, the more certain we are, or so we, we believe, in the way that, you know, where that northern hemisphere temperature was. And, and look how well, especially since about 1300 AD, the model is tracking the observations at the hemispheric level. I mean, that's pretty amazing that we've gotten to that point. And these are models of intermediate complexity. You know, we, could, we have better models. And <coughs> but there are also some big disagreements. You know, this is the time where the, the, impact, the, the actual policymakers want to make sure that, well, we don't just rest on our laurels where we've got them, that we nail, we figure out why we get disagreements and what that means for our projections into the future. The devil's in the dynamics. Here's a great example, a paper that came out this year. I don't know um, if any of these guys are here, um, but it's a really cool paper in the sense that Let's look at the medieval period in now and try and tease it apart. Why was it so much warmer in some parts of the world, like North Atlantic and Europe, and not in the other? Why did you have these hydrologic anomalies? And this is just a first stab at this, very good first stab. But the point is, it's now time to figure out why we see the regional patterns in past climate, not just, you know, the hockey stick. If you go to the southwest United States where I live, you know, there's this big debate about why do we have those big mega droughts, decades long droughts, perhaps longer. You know, and there's a growing body of evidence going against the old paradigm, which is um, it's all about the tropical Pacific. Now we're getting a more nuanced view of this that the, the Atlantic is playing a big role on the hydrology of the western United States and it's the interaction between these and we still got a ways to go before we can be confident that we're getting it right for the future, although we're pretty sure that the models don't simulate this kind of variability um, without forcing the SSTs. And you can see Jess's uh, poster tomorrow if you want to see this study, which was just accepted in GRL. Another example of this, and I'm using some from our own lab, is uh, the work that Tim Shanahan published in Science with a bunch of us uh, this last uh, spring. And what this work showed is two things that were really quite important, probably more than that, but the two things I thought that were really cool were one, the relationship between Sahel hydrologic status and the North Atlantic that is observed during the instrumental period is a robust feature of the climate system. It, that same relationship extends back, this is a coherency spectrum between a reconstruction of northern, uh, of the uh, North Atlantic uh, multi-decadal oscillation, right? And the Lake Basumpti record, um, this is a 600 year uh, comparison and there's just whopping uh, statistical relationship in this frequency band. The other thing Tim showed though that's much more disheartening and Many of the people who work in Africa already know this, but it's another record sort of illustrating. This is an annually dated record, you know, VARV record, but it's got um, these amazing multi-proxy evidence for these amazing uh, low stands in the lake. And Tim even did the hydrologic modeling to tell you how much less precipitation that likely was. But these, these suckers were over 100 years long, and we don't really understand why. It's not clear, we don't have the Atlantic proof that it was the Atlantic causing these, um, but it, what, an, what component of the climate system and the SST anomalies led to these just incredibly persistent and if they were to occur today, devastating droughts. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about biogeochemistry and, and greenhouse gases, lack of time, this fig these set of figures, I think, again, what we did in the air four is we really showed how trace gases have, have varied with climate in the Earth system over the last several hundred million years. And in this case, showing one of the figures from our chapter, really showing how things evolved, or maybe the summary from policymaker figure from our chapter, 
based on our chapter, over the last 20,000 years. And uh, Fortunat was the, and along with uh, Dominique Reynaud were the, the heroes behind this, and Fortunat's talking tomorrow, fortunately. So he's gonna go exactly where I think the whole IPCC has to go. It's time now to not describe how things change, but let's nail down why they changed and make sure that that informs our understanding of what's gonna happen next. Okay, here's the mystery. I think I've been pretty transparent. Everyone's probably figured it out by now. Why is working group two saying, paleo, we need paleo. Make sure we get more paleo. Um, it's great, you know, pat ourselves on the back. Does anyone wanna take a gander? It's pretty, I've said it over and over. It's the recognition that the models may not, and we have to make sure, right? We have to assess this. We have the data now, we're do, you know, all these modeling groups are doing the model runs that are necessary, or at least starting to. We have to make sure, or de decide, whether the models have, can capture the full range of climate system variability or not. And if they can't, we better come up with a backup solution to inform decision making. It's not good enough to say, well, we don't have a model of dynamic ice sheet behavior, so we can't tell you an answer. That's not good enough. We have to be, we don't have a model that can really simulate mega droughts, so we're not gonna talk about mega droughts. Big decisions are getting made, they gotta know these, they gotta know these things. And even if the uncertainty is larger than we would like, it's better than flipping a coin, all right? So they're very interested in hydrologic and other extremes, mega droughts, hurricanes. There's a good paper coming out, uh, Mike Mann sent me on hurricanes uh, that really is an interesting eye-opener. Uh, you know, we got a problem, folks. Um, sea level, we've talked about that already. Gotta, we gotta constrain what those ice sheets can do. Other potential abrupt changes and thresholds. The system is rife with these thresholds and abrupt changes. We all see them in our records. What do they mean about the climate system behavior and how it might change in the future? You see all these IPCC curves that are kind of smooth, and we know that's not how the climate system usually behaves. The climate system likes to go in fits and starts. And can we say more about that? Do our models capture that? If not, what are we gonna do about it? This is what matters to regional decision making. This is what really matters to the policymakers for whom this whole IPCC process is designed. Okay, so it's gonna ultimately be, a it's gonna be using the models and what they can tell us together with the observations, including paleo, to inform decision making. We've gotta figure out a way to do that. All right, so in conclusion, um, everyone in the room, I hope, based on this talk and hopefully before that, will be thinking about relevance more and more in their work. Uh, four years of peer-reviewed literature still have an impact we can all have an impact. Now's the time to really start pushing on your, your, your coolest science that you think is relevant. Um, follow the process, it's all on the web, it's transparent, get to know the lead authors, work with the team, whether it's a paleo chapter or not. Work with whomever you think your science is relevant. Make sure it's heard, and maybe it will be assessed and not mentioned, <laughs> maybe it will. And don't be afraid to, you know, get involved in the review process if you're not part of the authorship, you know, share your information that way. Um, and then my own pet peeve, let's stop plotting time from right to left, folks. Because everyone in IPC, you know, and the rest of the world looks at that like, what's wrong with it? <laughs> it's not just a joke, but yeah, you're supposed to laugh. Okay. I really want to see the whole field 10 years from now plotting time the same way as the rest of the world does. All right. Any questions? Do we have time for that? I don't know. You know, if you have a real cool paper that you want me to, to potentially show off and, I mean, show off or at least mention in Venice, send, you know, email it to me. 
you know, impress, published would be best. Yes. There's been a lot of debate about that. The scoping meeting will decide. But from the documents I've read, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, they want to hear more about the, they want us to assess the uh, geoengineering. And it's a very good point. I guess that would come in chapter three, or working group three, and some of those would indeed tap paleo. So that's a good, good comment. Dr. Anderson. Yeah, I'm not sure how to turn it on though. Um, Peck, uh, you, made the, you framed the sensitivity question in terms of the sensitivity of temperature to climate forcing, but several people at this uh, meeting have already made the point that what people really care about is rainfall, so precipitation. Are, is this community starting to think about the sensitivity or the amount of change in precip relative to climate forcing? Can paleo contribute to that? Yes. You know, so a good example of what's going on in the Western United States, we think, is you got the warming, and the warming is having a big effect on our hydrology because it's melting snow earlier in the system and the stream flow is going down. And we can attribute now at the regional scale. That's another big thing that's going to start coming out in the AR5 over the AR4. It's not just continental scale attribution. But the other thing that's happening, which is interesting, is that we're getting a change in the mean position of the jet in springtime. And that means less storms coming into the southwest. And that's, you know, it's, it's in the mod, most of the models. It's really amazing. Mother Nature, the models, everyone agrees. But it seems to be happening much quicker. So the question would, in that case would be, you could pose it as, you know, what's the sensitivity of that jet and the northern hemisphere circulation to warming? Is it, as represented in the models, which would suggest that the changes we're getting now should be taking place, you know, 80 years from now, or is the sensitivity actually much larger? And um, unfortunately, even though I, I, I hang out with a lot of climate dynamicists, um, you know, there is probably some baggage with that term climate sensitivity. And you know, we as a community have to come to grips, you know, as a broader community, have to come to grips of you know, exactly how we say it. But in essence, we we're going to be looking and, at exactly that problem. What's this, how many more, you know, how much bigger uh, will the hurricanes and tropical cyclones and typhoons be as a function of temperature increase? You know, these things aren't all going to scale um, the same. And the other thing is, if we, as paleo scientists, of course, there's many sensitivities. There's a sensitivity is, is forcing dependent. You know, if it's solar forcing versus Milankovitch forcing versus volcanic forcing, they have different sensitivities. And, it, and it gets, so it gets pretty damn complicated. Uh, Peck, I was hey. wondering, uh, a few years back in the middle of the hockey stick debate, I was asked to come to Washington and talk to some people by the Pew Center for Global Climate Change. And at the time, they said, do not use the word uncertainty, no matter what you do. And so we worked out all kinds of other ways to describe uncertainty because they said that at the, that, that would be interpreted as meaning we simply don't know what, what we're talking about. Now, that was like four years ago, and times have changed. And I was wondering, from, at the level of policy, um, are there still issues with regard to how we describe uncertainty, that any kind of guidance that you might give from your experience, or is it simply flat out, we can just talk about it the way we talk about it amongst ourselves? Or where, where, does, the, where does the policy science interaction happen with regard to that? Yeah, I think we have to be very precise. Um, when we're talking about ourselves, we can drink lots of beer and we can say whatever we want and get away with it. But when we're talking to the public, the press, policymakers, we have to really be precise. And you see this all the time. If you look in the, in the newspapers, in the United States at least, you know, across the country some science paper comes out or something and one of your colleagues has you know, decided to come out of the lab for the first time and just, you know, because someone got to them and they, and they sort of say what they'd say, you know, like off the cuff, um, like they're talking to a colleague. And it comes across in the press as not as intended. <laughs> and I see this a lot and I, I cringe. And I think um, eventually we have to all, uh, you know, there's this Leopold uh, leadership program and anyone who's, 
everybody should try and be part of that, young scientists um, up to mid-career. It's a fabulous thing. I haven't done it, but I know a lot of people have. You know, we need training, and I think a lot of us in our generation have gotten sort of on-the-job training. <laughs> we've made our mistakes, and hopefully we learned. But you can talk about uncertainty. You just have to define it. Um, I think it's very important to talk about probabilities, and I think one of the things that our whole field is going towards is much more uh, effective use of probabilities. Decision makers are not nearly as dumb as some of our political leaders on a certain side of the spectrum would like us to believe. <laughs> These guys can use uncertainty, they can use probabilities very effectively. Hell, how many Americans think about going to Vegas or their local casino? People know how to use probabilities. And it's really important for us to just be very precise. So I think that's the answer. I would not be shy, but I would not go out and say, oh yeah, the, the reporter X has called me up and I'll just sort of um, take a quick break from the lab and go and talk to them. Uh-uh. You, whenever you talk to a reporter, before you talk to the reporter, decide what is important for that reporter to understand and make sure by the end of the conversation that reporter understands that, no matter what they want to talk about. And there are a bunch of other tricks like that. If, if they ask you something where you're not sure, don't say anything. There's no reason you have to sort of expose your, you know, what you don't know. Because we all don't know something. And that stuff gets into the press, it gets you know, turned in America at least, into like the scientists don't know what the hell they're talking about. Which is totally opposite the truth. Okay, we are very precise when we think we know something really well and when we don't. We gotta, we gotta be clear. Hi, Jonathan. Um, one of the key things that I think is very important for, for people in this room to pay attention to is how much of the paleo work that went into AR4 was based on data syntheses. People pulling together multiple records, multiple proxies across multiple labs, doing the hard work to calibrate them, get the dating right and all of that. Um, and that was what was compared to the models and that was what informed the credibility of the models going into the future. If we're going to do more of that because of the paleo runs that are going to be part of CMIP5, we have to have better and more data syntheses of important targets, including you know, the 8.2 killer event, the Pliocene, the parts of the LGM, and all the rest of it. And I don't think it can be stressed um, strongly enough that it is the data synthesis products that will be the most relevant. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And uh, as I said, the IPCC does not do research and probably one of the most important types of research we can do is the synthetic research. And this is the time to do that too because if we can get that kind of work into the peer review literature in time, it can be very effective, but if we wait two more years to start, as many of you who know have done this kind of work, you won't get it into press in time. So absolutely. 